Good morning. Welcome on this third Sunday of Lent, this beautiful day the Lord's created for us. Aren't you glad you're not in California in the Lake Tahoe area? Like 10 feet of snow? I'd love to have one of those days, but uh, all of you would be very mad at me for praying for that. But spring is almost here. And the Lord, it's all in his hands, and we just uh, thank you for joining us. Just a few announcements before we begin the service. Uh, There's a lot of new stuff in there. There's a lot of things that you uh, just need to be able to read, pray about, join us in. Remember, Holy Week is coming up at the end of the month. Uh, We have a listing of there of Holy Week uh, services and activities. On the back of your bulletin is the slate of a new adult electives in Sunday school. Of course, we have classes for all ages. Again, I just want to prompt you to join us in Sunday school. There are very good uh, discipleship time for us. Discipleship can also happen on days of the week. We have weekly Bible studies. They're listed there for you. Um, We've also promote discipleship with your personal devotional life. Stop by and pick up our daily bread, two, one for yourself, one to give away. Many other things there. Out there on the tables, you may see on the display table pictures. Those pictures are 40 years old. We found them in a cabinet here. We don't get rid of anything you know, Uh, but uh, maybe we'll start dispersing stuff. If you like those pictures, leave them hang around for a couple weeks so others can enjoy them, and then you're welcome to take yours home or your friend's home there. Uh, Some that are living out of the area now, I think we're going to surprise them by mailing them to them, Uh, but 40 years ago, that's their pictures from the 1980 pictorial directory here at St. David's, so uh, Uh, I'm looking for Sterling. Where's Sterling? Yeah, there's a picture of Sterling out there. Uh, How old were you then, Sterling? 1980. Jolie, do the math for him. Uh, He he was younger. Younger. Uh, Can't do the math anymore. But uh, John Stow, it looks like the picture was taken yesterday. Uh, John just has that looks and, and, and health that keeps it going and going. And uh, let's just celebrate the lives that it des- describes there and captures for us and uh, uh, look at them together and celebrate that. And uh, that's all the announcements. Uh, I'm going to invite you to stand, welcome one another, and we're going to remain standing for our first song. Uh, praise team is going to change it up a little bit. We're waiting for the graphics to arrive. Good morning, everyone. (laughs) We're a little confused here this morning, so we're going to do something different. But um, I heard some words this morning uh, as I listened to the radio and on the way to church, and they just spoke to me. They're words from a song, and it says, Praise is the waters my enemy drowns in. So we have come this morning to praise the Lord. And another uh, song I love this song. It says, come on and praise the Lord with me. Sing as you love him too. 
Come on and lift your voice to him. He's worthy of all our praise. So church this morning, let's praise him. Okay, because I was silly and forgot the thumb drive, we're going to start out with a hymn instead today. And hopefully Andy will get back with the thumb drive before we're done with it. But we're going to start out with hymn number 198, Wonderful Grace of Jesus.
word. Okay, well, you know what? Our first song that we're going to do is Come Let Us Worship and Bow Down. And it is um, fairly repetitive, so I'm thinking maybe we can go ahead and try that. What do you think? Good? Okay, good. worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For He is our God. And we are the people. And we are the people of His pasture. And the sheep you lived closer to the church. <laughs> um, let's see. What would be the best thing to do? Well, can we, should we go to Shepherd of Love now? Okay. That one is in the hymnal. It's actually our last song. However, it's hymn number 464 in your hymnal. And we will, that's taken from Luke 15, 3 and 4, which says, Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? Shepherd of love.
Church family, let's pray together this morning. O oh Lord God Almighty, we thank you for sending us the shepherd of love. We thank you that he does walk by us and he guides us each and every day. We are so thankful and we are so grateful. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus in our lives. I pray, Lord, this week that you would um, walk with us in everything that we do, in the hard times and in the good times. We know you're there, and we thank you, and we pray in the name of Jesus, the shepherd of love. Amen. Psalm 23, a Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you, Titus. I hope you... Uh, Really appreciate the youth service during Lent. We've been asking them to read the scriptures uh, for us and lead us in that reading. So thank you, Titus. Uh, we're going to sing one more song uh, before our prayer time. And um, I feel led that we would uh, just have a brief time of just after uh, singing Gentle Shepherd to um, have a time of just praise and thanksgiving uh, if you have something to share, a God sighting, uh, God's blessings, share that with us and we'll use that to worship the Lord today. 458, Gentle Shepherd. Children are dismissed to junior church. <clears throat>
hope that song's a, a prayer for you and worship, but also acknowledgement of uh, that he comes and leads us, he blesses us, he protects us. And let's move that into a time of praise and thanksgiving. Where have you seen God blessing with his grace and power as a shepherd? Anybody like to share? Yes, Nancy, good. And Sophie, is it? No. Grace, sorry, Grace. If you couldn't hear in the back, she was praising the Lord for the gift of their new puppy, Grace. Gracie, Gracie, Gracie. Anyone else like to share? Donna? If you remember back in January, we had a lady representing InterVarsity Christian Fellowship from your college, Beth Wharton. Uh, Donna is describing uh, Beth's mother's funeral. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Okay, Randy first, then Patty, then I see her somebody else in the back, I think maybe. Go ahead. Or 
college and became happy with my addition. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, it's not a, I'm not lifting them up. I'm just saying I'm just so thankful that this church <coughs> produces such good people. We are family, and we serve and care for one another. Thank you, Randy. Patty. I just want to say, when I think of a shepherd, I think of our pastor. And I was not sure who put that bill when I first started this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Patty. Thank you. Was there somebody else I heard in the back, maybe? If not, will you join me? Okay. Can you stand up a minute so we can... Will you join me in prayer? O oh, gentle shepherd, we seek you. And you told us if we seek you, we'll find you. Once we find you and know your presence, may we listen to you. May we follow you. We are needy sheep. We need direction. We need nutrients for our bodies and souls, our minds. We need comfort. We need your strong arms lifting us and carrying us through the tough times. We need your shepherd's staff that will draw us back, correct us. We bring these offerings of praise and thanksgiving to you, recognizing your provision and care of us. We pray for Bob and his spiritual need of salvation, of a Savior, a Lord for his life, and a gift of eternal life, a new life in Jesus. May he respond to your truth. Lord, may your Spirit now lead us in this time of hearing your word and applying it and living it. And may your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's take our Bibles and turn to the Gospel of John. We're looking at chapter 10 today. And um, I forgot to say it early in the announcements to take those attendance registers. So do that also right now if you haven't done so already. And Pass that attendance register. We want to acknowledge everybody's attendance with us today. We're in part three of our series called <laughs> Symbols of Grace. <clears throat> Finding uh, things that represent God's grace to us. Uh, two weeks ago, we looked at the living water that Jesus offers, and he met the woman at the well. And then uh, last week, we had the symbol of the fish, or Ithacus, uh, the fish symbol, and usually in the design, or uh, we see it there in the word Ithacus. Anybody remember what that means? 
Ithacus. It literally means fish, but there's the letters mean something. Right. Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. Okay, all the Greek letters that make that up, those first letters make up that uh, phrase. It comes from ancient Christianity and the symbol of the fish, the symbol of, uh, of Christianity and Jesus Christ. And again, reminding us, Jesus Christ, Son of God and Savior. Today, we look at the shepherd's staff, the shepherd's staff. And um, if you would do a study, you can always put, pick up a concordance in the back of your Bible, or uh, there's a full concordance. What that's in the back of your Bible is very a scaled-down version of a concordance. But if you look up the word shepherd and sheep, it's numerous, the appearances in the Old Testament and New Testament of the usage of the word shepherd and sheep. And one familiar one we heard uh, Titus read earlier, Psalm, Psalm 23, it begins, the Lord is my shepherd. David, who knew what it was like to be a shepherd, uses that imagery to reflect upon God and who he is and how he blesses. And he goes on and says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So you have the rod, which was a small, little, like rod. Some come up here in like a little bit of a weighted end to it, for used for throwing, maybe to change a sheep's path. Uh, a wolf may come or a fox may come in and try to disturb the flock. Uh, you throw it at them as a, a way of protection. Um, then you have the, the shepherd's staff. And I was just thinking this morning, every parent should have one of these. Now, I only got a four-month-old. You know, I got to interject something about my grandson in the message here. But, I mean, probably when he's about two, I'm going to need this. Laura, I'm going to borrow your staff, you know. But, and then when they get older to be a teenager, it should be electrified. <laughs> Even for the 20-somethings in your life. But, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting that no other livestock does this be used with. Um, you don't use it with pigs. You don't with, do, use it with cattle like steers and bulls um, and cows. You don't use that. It's only for sheep. It's, its design is only for sheep. Um, you have the hook where you see in that picture there. It's lifting up. Uh, maybe they get down into a, a ditch. You know, sheep are not very... Uh, handy with them. They just kind of like walking around. I call them like uh, living sponges. You know, they're just there. And uh, if the, they can't go too far in the water. You know, we hear in the scriptures, he takes me towards the, the still waters. You know, you don't want to take a sheep to the deep waters. They get in, the water soaks it up, and they, they're just gone. Okay, so uh, it's very interesting how the description of sheep and shepherd here and that, you know, it's used for guiding, prodding along, uh, defense, you could say even for animals and things like that. But again, it's only used for sheep is what we're told. And uh, let me read a, a quote. Uh, there, maybe some of you read this book some time ago. It's been around. It's kind of a classic. Uh, it's Philip Keller. He wrote a book called A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm. And I'm just going to repeat some of the things I just probably said, but he comments on the uniqueness of the shepherd's staff. I'm in a sense, in a sense, excuse me, the staff more than any other item of his personal equipment identifies the shepherd as a sh shepherd. No one in any other profession carries a shepherd's staff. It is uniquely an instrument used for the care and management of sheep and only sheep. It will not do for cattle, horses, or hogs. It is designed, shaped, and adapted especially to the needs of the sheep. And he goes on to say, Together the rod and the staff of the 23rd Psalm paint a picture of the divine shepherd who wields them. He is strong, competent, and trustworthy. He is present with his sheep, able to defend them and watch over them through all the dangers they face knowing that we have such a shepherd 
who is ready to protect us from danger, keep us close, and rescue us when we go astray, truly is a great comfort to us, the sheep. Amen. So we're in today, I could pick numerous passages to talk about the shepherd and uh, the God's grace that's shown by the shepherd. And I'm just going to give you just a few passages here from, uh, it seems like I'm fading in and out, but I think it's the placement of the mic here, excuse me. Isaiah 40, verse 11. He tends to his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lamb in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads them, leads those that have young. Now, this is a description of God himself, not really Jesus. Of course, Jesus is God and part of the Trinity, but it's uh, Israel was kind of given the imagery of God's sheep and he being the shepherd. Micah 5, 4, we know this to be a prophecy. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. Who's that talking about? Jesus. It's a pro prophecy of the Messiah. And again, the imagery of a shepherd. And I love this passage. Maybe you've heard me numerous times use this in a message or teaching. But it just tells me about the character of Jesus. Matthew 9, 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. That describes even today, people, right? You, before you came to follow the shepherd and learn how wonderful and gracious the shepherd is, you were one who was harassed and helpless. And as Christians, we even shouldn't even feel that way. But I know we do get there. We do get harassed and helpless at times. But we're not alone. We have a shepherd there to guide us and deliver us and help us. So go with me to John 10. John 10. And um, we're going to start previously, pre, uh, prior to even these scriptures that are up on the screen here and in your outline. Because it, it captures there. And John 10, 1 starts. And Jesus is teaching. And he talks about the sheep gate or the door. And I'm just going to, because it kind of runs all together, I wanted to keep, keep the flow of Jesus' teaching instead of just picking and choosing. So follow along, I'll give a little bit of brief explanation uh, about what he says about the sheep gate, but we're going to look more at the shepherd. So Jesus is speaking, John 10, verse 1. I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Let me give you a little explanation then. Okay, so long ago, in the time of Jesus, the shepherds were there. They had pens, but they didn't do it with wooden fences. They had uh, field stone uh, fences. Or they'll make a pen, okay, and it had walls maybe about this high so the sheep could not get out. But, uh, and there was one opening. But there was no gate made. Like we have gates here for different fenced-in areas. The shepherd was the gate. So he, he, during the night, he stayed there and the sheep did not go out and also no animals could come in through the, the gate. Now, uh, a robber can go over and try to steal and, um, and so uh, he, he talks about that in a moment. But he, do you see some interesting things about the relationship with the sheep and the, and the shepherd already? He says, uh, the watchman, verse 3, 
opens the gate for them, and the sheep listen to his voice, the shepherd. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. So the sheep know his voice. That's an important thing to remember as we carry on into the understanding of the shepherd. When, the, when he has brought them out of his own, he goes ahead of them. He leads them. And his sheep follow him because they know his voice. We need to be discerning today. Is this what we're getting from God? The truth. And we, or what we hear and, and preached and taught, is it from God's word? Is it the same as the voice that we're hearing from Scripture? Okay, He calls his own sheep by name. He knows their names. He knows your name. When he's brought them out, he, they follow ahead. he follows him and they know his voice. Verse 5, but they never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Okay, again, we're talking about Jesus, but again, we've been warned about false teachers, antichrists, those that want to taint the gospel, distort, and probably bring a new gospel, and that's happening in our world today. But can you discern the truth that it's Jesus, God's word that's coming to you, or is it the fallacy of false teaching? We have to be discerning to this, and we only follow Jesus' voice and his teaching. Okay, let's look at verse 7. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers. He's saying false Christs, false teachers, false messiahs. They were thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate, verse 9, whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. So again, salvation, safe, protection, all come through Jesus. Verse 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Who may that be? Satan. Satan, Satan right? And all of his companions and the enemies that we have against us. But he says, I have come that they may have life, and have it to the full. Or some of your translations will say abundant life. So he says, I've come to bring life. I've not come to destroy or kill or steal. And let's move in then to the understanding of the shepherd. We got some imagery already of the shepherd. That's why I wanted to catch that part for you. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Good shepherd. Interesting. He could have just said, I'm the shepherd, right? I'm the shepherd. Capital S, shepherd. But he says the good shepherd. And there's some connotations we would say with that word good. And that it means of quality, of character, of nobleness there, okay? Uh, uh, this is the good shepherd. There may be other shepherds out there, but this is the true and good one and noble one. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So here we find something very important why he's good. As this shepherd is willing to die and will die for the sheep. Remember, Jesus is talking about himself. Verse 12. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and carries nothing for the sheep. I think we can imagine that. You know, you're, you employ somebody to watch your animals, watch your sheep, and danger comes. They're not going to put their life out there. They're not going to endanger themselves. They're not going to fight off a thief or someone to cause harm. They're going to run. But the one who owns the sheep, knows the sheep, willing to die for the sheep, he steps in and cares. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. We get that repeated again, don't we? I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. Jesus knows you if you're part of the flock. Got to... We can't make an assumption that the whole world 
is part of the flock, okay? We're talking very distinct here, okay? And we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a moment, the distinctives of the, of the sheep and the characteristics of the sheep. But he says, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. There's a relationship there. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Now he interjects the Father, okay? Not his father Joseph, his earthly human father, but you see that there's a capital F there in your translation most likely for Father. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. He's creating now some tension for his hearers, okay? His father, and, uh, and that he lays down his life. Verse 16 is another interesting thing here. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them along, bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Okay, Bible students, you can answer this. Who is he talking about? Hmm? We hear the church here. Uh, you know, and that's right. I think you guys are both right. It's the, the Jews and the Gentiles, which then make up the whole flock, the church. Jewish believers, Gentile believers, they're, they're the sheep, which eventually we could say are the church. Or the church. So uh, he again uh, is stirring things up. Israel, the Jews that were there listening, uh, the religious leaders, they're being disturbed because they know the imagery is the shepherd is God, the sheep are the Jews. But now he's referring that there's somebody else out there. Okay? Verse 17. Let me go back to 16. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up. This command I received from my father. Now, he's going deeper, and some are not capturing this at all, okay? He's kind of stopped talking for a moment about sheep and shepherd, and he's talking about himself. He is calling himself the good shepherd. He hasn't stopped that, and he has said the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, but he says, the reason my father loves me is Jesus obeys the father. He completes the mission that the father has sent him to do. The reason that my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. <clears throat> that last part, what's that referring to? The resurrection. The resurrection. He's going to die, lay his life down for the sheep, but he's going to live again. There's that Subtle reference to the resurrection. Verse 18. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. You think his trial, his punishment was a surprise to Jesus? No, not at all. He knew what was going to be there, and yet he, he did lay his life down for us. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. Because the Father called the Son, sent the Son, the command I received from my Father. Verse 19. As these words, at these words, the Jews were divided again. Many of them said, He is a demon possessed. He is demon possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? They're getting some of the things that he's saying. And they're saying, you're being heretical here. Really, man. I mean, you're getting to the point where we're going to have to do some things here. Verse 21, others said, 
These are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? And if you read in chapter 9, and the, in chapter 9 where there was a healing uh, of a man uh, born blind, and so they're making reference to that. So some were very skeptical, angered, because he's speaking totally against what they've always taught and knew. Uh, and uh, they're not accepting that he is the Messiah and he is the Christ. But there are some were saying, hey, yeah, this teaching may be new and different, but who can open the eyes of the blind? A demon doesn't do it. So let's go on. Verse 22. Then came the feast of dedication at Jerusalem. It was in winter. It was winter. And Jesus was in the temple area walking in the Solomon's colonnade. The Jews gathered around him saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. So there are some that they started to believe and they had their questions. Is this the one we've been waiting for? Verse 25, Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The miracle I, miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. Making a distinction here. Jesus' is sheep, the Jewish leader's sheep, or the nation's sheep. But he says, there's my sheep, my sheep. He's making a distinction here. Verse 27, my sheep listen to my voice. Hear that again? Repeat it often. When Jesus or anybody in Scripture repeats something often, that's trying to tell you to wake up and pay attention. And he says, my sheep listen to my voice. What make us different from the rest of the world is that we listen to Jesus. We listen. Okay? My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. He says, I know them. He says, I know you. Each one of you here today. I, Jesus says, I know you. I know your thoughts, your anxieties, your fears, your things that you enjoy in life. I know your sin. I know the temptations you face. I know all that about you. Verse 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. So you're just not just you're part of the sheep. There's some expectations, requirements of what the sheep act like. They know the shepherd. They listen to him. They follow him. Verse 28, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. So, he gives them a gift, the sheep, the part of his flock that are in his flock. Eternal life. Eternal life. Remember back what he said about uh, the thief that comes to steal, destroy, and kill? You remember he says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full or abundant life. Here he says eternal life. Verse 29, my father has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my hand, Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Okay? So, again, you're part of the sheep. The wolves come. They're not going to steal you away unless you want to follow the wolves and the thieves and you want to reject the shepherd. But they can't snatch you away. He will preserve you, protect you, secure you. Then in verse 30, he says, I and the Father are one. That provokes. Look at verse 31. Again, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? Verse 33. We are not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews but for blasphemy, whereas you, a mere man, claim to be God. That's what they had the problem with the good shepherd. 
They wanted his miracles. They wanted the power of God displayed. They didn't want to hear him equating himself with God. What makes him the good shepherd? He is the son of God. Jesus Christ, son of God, savior. We carry that theme from last week. So let me uh, pose some questions, and they're on your outline for later on too. But are you one of Jesus' sheep? Are you part of his flock? Okay? And he says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. A Christian, one who has new life, abundant life, and eternal life in Jesus, you have to be identified as one who knows Jesus, who he is, what he's done for you at the cross, the tomb. Listen to him. Do you read the Gospels? Do you say, yes, I need to hear and obey? And it says, a follow. That's, again, the description of obeying. So you need all three. Because the world knows about Jesus, but they haven't made the step to follow or listen. Okay? And when do Christians get themselves in trouble? They're part of the, the flock, and, and they're, they, they're listening, but they're only listening. They're inspired, feels good, but do they make change and follow the shepherd's leading? That he wants to lead you away from the world, the flesh, and the devil, and following his ways and his kingdom work. Are you one of Jesus' sheep? Do you listen to Jesus' voice? Can you distinctly know the difference between truth and false things? True and false things. Do you know the distinguish? Do you know the scriptures enough to discern that? Okay? Do you listen to Jesus' voice? It comes by the word it comes by the Spirit of God dwelling in you, that conviction that's there. Does your life show that you follow Jesus? I've asked you often through the years, are you a more mature, and we'll even say better Christian than you were a year ago? Have you matured and grown more in your relationship with Jesus? and your obedience, and your life changed, and that full life that he's giving you? There's a show there. What have you discovered about Jesus' goodness as a shepherd? If we had time, we should break into a, again, a praise time, a thanksgiving time, where you've seen Jesus be the good shepherd for you. What are you doing to share with others the truth that Jesus is the good shepherd and wants to give them eternal life? What are you doing to share the good news about the good shepherd and how he changed your life, he has saved your life? And he's done that the same for others if they will become part of the flock. <laughs> Jesus, our good shepherd. His staff, his staff is there. He corrects us. He guides us. He draws us. So much imagery there of God's grace, and especially in the description of the good shepherd. Do you follow, listen, and know the good shepherd? Let's pray. Oh Lord, our good shepherd, the gentle shepherd, the compassionate shepherd who has seen us harassed and helpless and sheep without a shepherd. But I pray that each one here would testify they're not without a shepherd. They know a good shepherd. And when they're harassed and they feel helpless, they're under attack they call out to the good shepherd and find how he is gracious and powerful and a protecting shepherd. 
Lord, thank you for revealing this truth today. Challenge us, Lord, as we listen, know, and follow you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's uh, take our hymnals and respond in worship and song with 462, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. 462. Let's stand. The blessing of the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Hebrews and to us. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead of our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.